Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. It certainly wasn't like this in 1945. (laughs) I was spiritually dead in 1945, and isn't it great to be spiritually alive in 85? Um, Before I forget, I want to thank the committee and the man with the water. For the marvelous hospitality, you know, it's really a great honor to be here. We've had such warm hospitality, our friend Gary from Australia and I. And um, it's been such an honor, actually, listening to the workshops and the speaker last night to realize that I was on a program with so many distinguished lushes and queers. Uh, if up until now you think this has been a good roundup, I agree with you. Up until now it has been. <laughs> if it starts going downhill from here on, consider the caliber of the committee that put it together. <laughs> Pillheads and sodomites and lesbians and... <clears throat> <laughs> That's who we are. Uh, I just love being at this kind of a meeting, and there haven't been this kind of a meeting all these years, where I get to see all my tomboy sisters and my sissy brothers. (laughs) I'm not going to talk about my drinking, but I'm reminded to do something else I'm supposed to do. And that is to bring you greetings from Lois Wilson. I talked to Lois last night, uh, yesterday afternoon. Lois is not very well, you know. She's really quite fragile and feeble. She's in her 80s. And she's saving up her strength, supposed to be saving up her strength to get to Montreal for the 50th anniversary convention there. And uh, I've been Lois's traveling companion. As a matter of fact, the last time I was was in uh, Minnesota, we were here for, I brought Lois out here for the first Al-Anon state convention in, I think, 1982. And she had a marvelous time. Uh, we both did. We loved it. And um, so I called her from here and told her I was. I called her, uh, uh, told her where I was, and I was. I was at an AA meeting. I didn't describe the kind. <clears throat> I said it was a big AA bash of some kind. And um, she said, "Well, you give them all my love." So I give you all her love. And um, I said, "What have you been doing? Hoping she's staying in bed." And taking the medication, she has seven terminal illnesses standing each other off for the honor of killing her, you know. Uh, She's somewhere in her 90s, between 91 and 99. Um, It varies from year to year. Uh, And I think that's fine when you get to be your 90s. Last year, I swear, she told me she was 96. This year, she says she's 94. Uh, I think that's the way she remembers it, you know. Um, And that's just fine by me. But Lois said to give you all her love, and she hopes to see all of us in, um, in Montreal, all of us, all of us who can get there. I'm not going to talk about my drinking for several reasons. One is, it is so damn boring. 
You've all heard drunkologues, and you will hear a lot of them, and they're very important. And I try to tell my drunkologue, I make myself tell it at least twice a year, because I think it's good to keep that memory green. But I think there's something more important for me to do here tonight. Uh, in addition to being boring in telling my drunkologue, I've discovered lately that when I start to tell my drinking story, I lie a lot. Well, it happened a long time ago. You know, I've been so much, much longer than I drank. And um, it was embarrassing to make this discovery. I was at an AA banquet and, uh, of some kind, anniversary, and um, I knew it was going to be a happy occasion, so I was going to tell my story with none of the sad parts in it. Uh, <laughs> just the happy parts, you know. Some of my suicides. Um <laughs> The outside world really does wonder about us, you know. We say suicide and everybody goes ape with laughter. <clears throat> so I was telling this suicide story, which is the best suicide story I know. It's marvelous. And uh, just as I got to the punchline, I caught the eye of an old friend sitting right down in front. And I realized what I was telling never happened to me. It happened to him. <laughs> You know, it was the kind of thing that could have happened to me. So uh, I had just picked up my story and was embroidering it a little bit. Uh, uh, picked up his story, was embroidering my story with it. I will give you a, a, a caps, uh, in capsule form my AA history, however. Um, I did walk into AA in January 1945, and that very first day, I learned one fact about all AA members, which is still true. That is that there are two kinds of AA member. And I happen to know there are both kinds in this room. A great number of people, we think now from the annual, the triennial surveys made with the General Service Board, there are now uh, about 40% of the people who walk into AA or make some contact with AA sober up just like that and never again have another drink as long as they live. Others of us are more patient about our recovery. I'm not alone, am I? <laughs> I had a sober year, and then I experimented, and then I had sober five years, and then I experimented again. And uh, the last drink was in, in um, uh, May 1952. I don't know what day. I don't care what day. I uh, discovered after I got out of the hospital that I didn't want to go back to the hospital, and I would start. I didn't want to drink. Uh, I, I really wanted to drink, but I thought, well, I'll go to the AA so I won't have to go back to the hospital. And about a month after I started going back to meetings in 1952, I began to wonder about my fifth anniversary. I'm sober one month, and I'm wondering about my fifth anniversary. I'll have to go back and find out what day I had my drink so I can decide when to have my fifth anniversary. <clears throat> and at that, that moment, I realized what a nut I was and how, what kind of projection this was. And I said, it doesn't matter a damn when I had my last drink as long as I don't drink today. And I've never gone back to find out what day it is. Um, I'm an alcoholic. I think you can tell that by the way I, where I sound sober. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about primarily our third tradition, I think, and the, its history as it has affected me personally and what I have witnessed in AA uh, from a particular point of view. Uh, of course, this is simply my uh, one person's uh, view, viewpoint. None of us, as all of you know, uh, speaks for AA as a whole. And I certainly can't pretend to, or for any group. But I think the third tradition is about people who, don't, who are not connected, who have felt for a long time they didn't belong, uh, who felt alienated, who felt different in one way or another. Whether we actually were or not is unimportant. We felt alienated, isolated, ostracized. We felt different and outside. When I was a kid growing up in Texas, I ran away from home a lot. And it's an easy picture for me to remember because I had on, I was barefooted and had on bib overalls and I probably had a bandana handkerchief with some food in it and I was, a, I was also a sissy and a, and a fraidy cat so I didn't ever go very far. I always got, you know, I always got home by, by nightfall. But I was not trying to escape from anything because I had no reason to escape. I was trying to get in somewhere. I was trying to find the place where I really would feel I belonged. 
And for many years after I was an, I started to say a grown person, well, I was tall anyhow, um, uh, taller, um, I kept thinking, I was born in the wrong century. That's what's the matter with me. And then I'd take another drink. Um, <laughs> now, I have a dear, beloved friend in Texas, a uh, girlfriend, uh, who was, went to, I went to school with. I, was, I didn't, was not running away from home because I was not loved. I was loved at home. Um, I, as I repeat, I was just running to find some place where I felt that I belonged. And I remember I was a little bit late finding out about uh, some sex matters. I was actually in my teens um, when I discovered, uh, I went into show business, and discovered in show business that um, most adults, this was never discussed at home, most adults when they engaged in sexual activity had partners. <laughs> I was, I thought that was a very jolly idea. And I wondered why I hadn't thought of it myself. Um, <laughs> and I determined at that point not to ever in my life, and I haven't, rule out one half the human race in advance as potential partners. Um, uh, I've been married and, uh, uh, I'm in intercontinental, not bi-coastal. Um, <clears throat> uh, but this, this dear old friend of mine, this girl, we were in show business together. She was a, the, uh, what would now be called a Las Vegas type showgirl, a very tall, beautiful woman, wore, wore beautiful um, uh, gowns on the stage and a G string and pasties and things like that. And all she had to do was walk around and show off all these feathers and her beautiful body. And uh, the rest of the time she was, had her hair up in rollers and sitting around barefooted. But she wasn't uh, an educated person. Uh, very much, and uh, I began to think I'd better try to explain to Marzell what I was. She was very important in my life, and it was very important for me to explain this to her. So I tried to explain to her that I, as I understood it, apparently some men fall in love with other men, not with women, and apparently some women fall in love with other women, not with men. I said, do you think you understand that? She said, no. I don't think I ever would. And I said, well, it's very important. It's because I think I'm one of those. And she said, well, honey, it must be a wonderful thing to be if you're one. I think that's one of the most dramatic illustrations of unconditional love I've ever heard. And years later, about ten years later, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> I was able to take her to an AA meeting with me in New York. And I said to her, I was trying to explain to her, she had witnessed some of my alcoholism. And so I was trying to explain to her something about alcoholism before we went, and the fact that I was an alcoholic, and I had forgot all about that other conversation, and so had she. And um, I said, do you understand that I'm, I didn't drink and do those things because I wanted to, but because I have this illness and I am an alcoholic? Do you think you understand that? She said, no. I never will. And, uh, but she said, if you're one, it must be a great thing to be. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk much more about the old days because I don't really like talking about the good old days. I don't think those were the good old days in AA. I think these are the good old days. AA is at least 205 reasons, better for 205 reasons today than it was in 1945, and all 205 of you sitting right there, look around, look at yourselves, you're beautiful. We're far better off than we were then, far better off. We did the best we could with what we had. And uh, I was lucky enough to fall into the hands, as I uh, fell into a, a, fall into the hands of two homosexual persons, one man and one woman. And uh, in those days, we were not closeted in 1945, we were sealed in vaults. Uh, but we had that we had that x-ray vision <laughs> we spotted each other and um, dear God bless their hearts one, one of them is still alive one is gone but uh, we, we remained friends all, all her life and all he's his, still living we remained friends all this time, and we held hands desperately together 
very much because we felt uh, we were the only three that we saw staying sober. We would see other people come in who were gay, obviously, and then they would leave. And we only, the only three of us seemed to be staying sober, and that was very frightening, very frightening indeed. Now, the third tradition was not written in 1945 when I arrived in AA. The, the traditions were not to be written until Bill started a series of articles in the Grapevine in 1946 called 12 Points to Assure AA's Future. And um, he wrote that the third tradition was one of them. And um, by the way, somebody asked me a few weeks ago if I had uh, actually met Bill Wilson. And I stopped to think about it and said, no, I never did. Um, nobody did. He was just there. We didn't make historic records, and we didn't know we were doing anything historic. Nobody kept records at all, as a matter of fact. It's a wonder we have any history at all, because we were too busy trying to stay sober, you know, and find a place to live and get jobs and get straightened out sexually and domestically and, or stay out of jail, uh, you know, running away from process servers and all those. We had a lot of problems and, um, and had to stay sober on top of all that. And you didn't meet, nobody introduced you to Bill. Bill was just there all the time, and he was having his problems, too. One of his big problems was we were jumping all over him all the time. Um, as you know, he later said, and years later, he's, it's on record several places, he said in writing the big book, which was published in 1939, he eventually became not the author, but the referee. Um, he would write a chapter and then read it aloud to the members in, um, in uh, New York and send it out to Akron, and they would read it out there, and everybody would jump all over the little chapter and mail it back to him, and he'd have to write it all over again. And now he was trying out these traditions on us, beginning in 1946. And every Sunday afternoon, many, as many of us as could, would go to his home up in Medford Hills, New York, Stepping Stones, where Lois lives now. And Bill would read to us what he had written about the traditions, and we would tell, all tell him what was wrong with it. And stomp all over it. And he'd mail it to Akron, and they would do the same thing. And he was, at, again, had to be the, um, a referee and figure out what the, and write down the traditions. Now, I'm going to read to you. Uh, a little section, just a few paragraphs, a few lines from the book Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions. I won't say what page because you can find it. The pagination has changed from time to time. You can find it in, in the section on Tradition 3, and I want you to hear it as it is written here, and then hear it in another way in Bill's voice, and uh, you will hear the difference. And I think when you hear it the next time, when you read this the next time, it will have a special meaning for all of us. Bill wrote, on the AA calendar, it was year two. In that time, nothing could be seen but two struggling, nameless groups of alcoholics trying to hold their faces up to the light. A newcomer appeared at one of these groups, knocked on the door, and asked to be let in. He talked frankly with that group's oldest member. He soon proved that his was a desperate case and that above all, he wanted to get well. But, he asked, will you let me join your group? Since I am the victim of another addiction even worse stigmatized than alcoholism, you may not want me among you, or will you? There was the dilemma, Bill wrote. What should the group do? This was published in 1952. In 1968, the last time he was able to address the General Service Conference before he died, Bill made a talk on all the traditions, and I was there because it was my job to write the conference report, not because I was a member of the conference. I was not a voting member, but I wrote the conference report for many years. And I, listening to Bill give his talk on the traditions, was old hat. I'd heard it many times, and I didn't pay attention to it. But recently, a dear friend of ours in, uh, in Brooklyn called me and said, I have found something quite remarkable, Bill said in 1968, and you ought to hear this tape. He made it at an open AA meeting, and um, it, there are lots of people there who were not members because this was the night before the conference opened, before all the conference delegates. That is, if the general service conference, for those of you who don't know, consists of a group of people elected from all the states and all the uh, Canadian provinces who got together once a week, once a year, and they spend a week fighting and arguing and talking, just like we do. And uh, they have no power, no power whatsoever, you know. They could go there and pass all kind of laws, and we would pay no attention to them and go right ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Drunks don't take orders, you know that. Um, 
But Bill was making his talk about the traditions, and here's what he said this time when he gave the talk. I'm going to play it. He had emphysema very badly. He was not easy for him to talk, but I think you will hear it as he talked. At about year two of the Akron group, a poor devil came to Dr. Baum in a grievous state. He could qualify as an alcoholic all right. And then he said, Dr. Bob, I've got a real problem to pull you. I don't know if I could join AA because I'm a sex deviate. Well, that had to go out to the group conscience, you know. Up to then, it was supposed that uh, any society could say who was going to join us. And pretty soon, the group conscience began to seethe and boil, and it boiled over. And under no circumstances could we have such a power and such a disgrace among us, said a great man. And you know, right then our destiny hung on a razor edge over this single case. In other words, would there be rules that could exclude so-called undesirabilities? And that caused us in that time, and for quite a time, respecting this single case, to ponder what is the more important, the reputation that we shall have, what people shall think, or is it our character, and who are we, considering our records? Alcoholism is quite as unlovely. Who are we? To deny a man his opportunity, any man or woman. And finally, the day of resolution came. And a bunch were sitting in Dr. Bob's living room, arguing what to do. Whereupon, dear old Bob looked around and blandly said, isn't it time, folks, to ask ourselves, what would the master do in a situation like this? Would he turn this man away? And that was the beginning of the A tradition, that any man who has a drinking problem is a member of AA, if he says so, not whether we say so. Now, I think that the import of this on the common welfare has already been staggered because it takes in even more territory than the confines of our fellowship. It takes in the whole world of alcohol. Their charter to freedom to join AA is a short. Indeed, it was an act in the general welfare. So there it was in his words, who the person was that thought he had to stick. I'm glad when Bill wrote the uh, chapter, however, that he even opened the door wider by saying, not pinning it down to any one addiction or any one condition, he said, 
any uh, uh, a person, uh, he said, man said he had an addiction even more stigmatized than alcoholism, and that could be anything. And so it opened the door for millions and millions of people to come into AA who might otherwise have felt they could not come into AA. I have to go back now just a minute and tell about um, a couple of experiences I had my first year. Uh, one of them was with Bill. Um, there I had this woman member and two other good woman members who were friends of Bill's, older women. They had lived in Paris many, uh, much of their lives, and um, they had no doubt that I was a gay man, and um, I didn't mind their knowing. And um, they said, we keep seeing fellows turn up here, not stay sober, and it has been suggested that maybe there should be special meetings for gay people. What do you think of that? And I thought, well, I don't know. I wasn't sure I could handle that many gay people at an AA meeting, you know. Uh, I was still in my closet, you know, um, my vault. Um, and um, they said, let's talk to Bill about it. So a luncheon date was set up, and we all went and had lunch with the three ladies and I at lunch with Bill. And they told Bill the story. I didn't speak up. They said, um, the, we keep seeing uh, uh, homosexual men uh, turn up in the AA, and uh, they don't seem to stay around. They leave. And one of these three women, by the way, wasn't, uh, 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 was a lesbian. And, um, but this was never announced. Uh, she was out of the closet except for, she was always in the closet except for her very closest friends. And uh, Bill knew, of course. And uh, they said to him, do you think it might be a good idea for these fellows to have their own meeting? Don't you think that might be a good idea? And Bill said, well, you know, it might be the best thing that ever came down the pike in AA. I don't know. I don't know. I tell you, let's think about it. Now, Barry, can you stay sober a little while longer? How long have you been sober? I told him almost a year. He said, well, now, you're, you've got friends. You can talk to these people, obviously, and you can talk to me. So you, you think you could make it, maybe make it for 18 months? Stay sober a little while longer before we get into this. And I said, oh, yes, I think I can. And he said, all right. When you, uh, in about, after you've been sober about 18 months or two years, Come back and we'll talk it over. Well, of course, by the time two years had passed, the place was alive with AA members, homosexual, bisexual, and uh, everything else, and um, transvestites and everything else, and it didn't matter to anybody all over New York there was this kind of member. Now, I know from hearing a man in, uh, in New Orleans that there was another city in which a group did try to set up a great gay group early in a history, and this was in the year 1947, before, again, before the traditions are written. But um, this is a group of fellows in, in Boston, and Bill was in Boston making a speech trying to sell those damn traditions of his, and um, people were very bored. And after they got, th he, he got through, <laughs> after he got through talking, he, he always knew when he was boring. And if you went up to talk, said to him, that was a good talk, Bill, he said, don't ever tell me that. You know I bored this pants off of them. It was awful. But, um, uh, but he could also be funny. And uh, these three fellows in um, Boston came up to him and said, we have a very special problem we want to talk to you about. He knew what it was like that. He said, wait a minute. Before you tell me what the problem is, are you willing to go to any lengths to stay sober? And they said, yes. He said, well, what's your problem? And they said, we want to set up a meeting for gay men. And he said, well, if that's the length you must go to, go do it. Why not? Go do it. I'm sorry to report that group didn't last very long. Um, the only place they could find to meet was the basement of the YMCA. Um, <laughs> and uh, it just didn't work. <clears throat> um, my next experience in my own, my own particular history was this. I did my, I don't know how I stayed sober that first year, really. I didn't particularly want to change. I don't think I tried to change. I memorized the steps in case anybody asked me like that, you know, for a spot check. Uh, <laughs> I memorized them, but I did nothing about them. And um, uh, I did the things they told me to do, which would keep me dry. I, I stayed sober one day at a time. I didn't take the first drink, which seemed to me very sensible. And um, I did my turn on sitting at the desk at the old clubhouse. We did not have an office. We had an old clubhouse in Manhattan, and it's no longer there. But as long as it stood there, I went back once a year to look at it. Uh, it was an old abandoned church building. It was a marvelous old building. 
And uh, one day I was doing my turn at the desk, answering the telephones and greeting the people who walked in. And there came in, sent by a policeman on the corner, a black man. We had at that time in New York no black AA members. We had seen a few black people come into the meetings and had tried very hard to befriend them and talk to them, but they left us. They did not stay with us. They, I think they found it was, as I put it so beautifully, it was too damn white, you know. Um, it wasn't for them. And uh, they left. Uh, well, this man walked in who was black. He was sent by a cop. He said, the policeman on the corner told me that maybe you could help me. He was not only black, but he had long blonde hair, like Veronica Lake. And um, <laughs> he was a real artist with makeup. He was beautifully made up. And he had on his back, strapped to his back, his entire worldly belongings. And he said, I just came out of prison, and I am a dope fiend, which is a phrase in, then in use. And uh, I am also an alcoholic, and I need help desperately. Well, I was the last person in the world to know what to do. And I ran around trying to get people to come in and help me in the office, and a great number of them found they had to play poker that afternoon. Um, it, they didn't want to come in and have, it wouldn't touch this with the 12-foot pole. Um, but some fellows had. And particularly one woman, one, one marvelous old woman. Uh, came and sat there for a long time and talked to him, and, and uh, but we didn't know where to start. How do you start helping somebody like this who had so many problems? And none of, none of those people could give me the, the answer, so I said, I'm going to call the person I know who's been sober longest, and I called Bill and said, Bill, here's the problem. I got so much to take the poor guy out and get him a cup of coffee to start with. And I said, here's the problem. This man is here, and I told him exactly what the man looked like and what the man told us, and I said, what do we do? He needs all kinds of help. And Bill was quiet a minute, and then he said, Well, now, did you say he is a drunk? I said, Oh, yes, we can all tell that. <laughs> that's right off the bat we could tell that. And Bill said, I think that's, only, that's the only question we dare ask. It's up to us now to help him. I'm sorry to say I don't know what happened to the man. He disappeared. <clears throat> Somebody else came on duty, and I, I left. And I don't know what happened to him. We never saw him again. I hope he made it somewhere, someplace, sometime. Um, the next thing that happened in my particular history, in uh, the uh, gay people in AA, the third, the, about the third tradition, came in 1973 and 1974, when some people from Southern California, God bless them, a lot of marvelous things happened in Southern California. Um, <laughs> just, uh, I was just out there at their roundup, and... Uh, it was a really a, a, a marvelous experience to get to see the you know, temperature 117 degrees. How many people can get sunban sunburns under, uh, lying around the pool all day and still stay sober? I don't know. But at any rate, um, these fellows from California were came to New York and or started telephoning New York and writing New York saying, we want to be listed in the A World Directory as a gay group. Ah. Uh, problem. The General Service Office staff has no power to do anything except what it is authorized to do by the General Service Conference. It meets once a year. And when we start talking about listing a group as gay group or lesbian group, we're getting into some black, some areas that are not just clearly black and white. We're beginning to tread kind of closely to several traditions. What about tradition, the tradition of exclusiveness? Uh, if we set up gay groups, do they exclude other people? That was one of the big arguments against it at the conference in 1973. Um, the staff took the subject to the conference and said, well, you will have to tell us what to do, whether you want to list these groups or not. And the discussion got going hot and heavy. It, went, it was really, really very, very distressing. And finally, at the end of the, um, end of the afternoon discussion, which was so hot and heavy, the chairman, I think, had a very smart idea, a very smart AA idea. He tabled the matter until next year. <clears throat> but this meant it was on the, is on the agenda for the conference for the next year. And so when the conference met in 1974, the question came up one afternoon, uh, came time to discuss this question, and the three of the delegates, 
one from Southern California, one from Chicago, one from Washington, D.C., had done their homework. They had been to all the gay groups they could find. They had talked to every gay member they could find. Uh, one of them reported that we probably wouldn't even have uh, enough people to man our uh, volunteer desks if we didn't have gay, if it weren't for the gay people. And um, uh, we want to, these men had talked to their gay constituencies, you might say, so they had, they knew what they were talking about when they talked about these groups and said they're very good at A, and if they want to be listed as gay, let them be listed as gay, why not? And, but that wasn't to settle, that was not to, enough to settle the argument. And the argument went on into the evening, and finally, the evening was called off because everything was getting pretty steamed, and the next evening's agenda was wiped off and t- devoted to this question. It had to be settled. Now, it is the pr- policy of the conference almost never to settle any issue uh, without total, almost total unanimity. We don't want to settle any matter as, um, simply by a majority vote. That would leave an unhappy minority. We want almost total unanimity at the General Service Conference. And I'm sitting there taking the notes and listening to this debate, and I'm hearing some people say, oh my God, we're going to let the queers in, and going to list queers? What do you do next year? List rapists? You know, rapist groups? And somebody else said, yeah, and then child molesters? Well, if you have read any of the literature on child molestation and raping and wife beating, you know there's a little alcoholism involved. So I'm pretty certain there are wife beaters, child molesters, and rapists in the AA, aren't you? And they deserve our love. And one um, man made a vicious speech about these uh, these deviants, he called them, as, as Bill used the old phrase, sex deviant. And um, I remember the delegate from uh, uh, one of the states that year was a tiny woman, and she ran to the microphone when he made some remark about sex deviants. He ran to the microphone, and she ran to the microphone and pulled it down to her face. She was only about three feet tall. Pulled it down to her face. She had a high, squeaky little voice, and she said, where I come from, alcoholics are considered deviants. About that time, about that time, a non-alcoholic doctor on our board of trustees, the board of trustees is 21 people, 14 are AA members, seven are not. They're our front, you know, they're just our front men. Uh, <laughs> one of them, which is just a, just a, a custom, we always make sure that, that the treasurer is a non-alcoholic. <laughs> uh, pretty obvious reasons, um, you know. If the uh, if the treasurer were now the treasurer of the board were an alcoholic, uh, sitting on a seven million dollar income every year from literature, it might be kind of tempting to use that power somehow. As a matter of fact, one year one of the treasurers did try to use the power and cut off the salaries because he didn't like some things some of the things that were going on in the office. But that that was straightened out, and he was pushed off the board very easily. Um, but. Um, um, this most non-alcoholic doctor, whom I had known long before he got onto our board, came up to my little niche where I was sitting in the back taking notes and said, Barry, when you first listed women's groups, did they go through all this? And I said, no. Well, he said, when you first listed in the directory young people's groups, did you go through all this? And I said, no, we didn't do this. So he walked to the microphone, and I'm not going to tell you his name, uh, but I... Oh, I think we owe this man a great debt of love. Um, <clears throat> walked the microphone and said, I understand. And this is, by the way, the only thing I ever heard him say at the conference, ever. He was on the board, I think, seven years. And this is the only w- words he ever spoke. said, I understand that when you listed young people's groups, you did not go through these shenanigans. Is that right? And everybody said, yes. He said, and when you listed women's groups, you didn't go through all this for all, did you? And everybody said, no, we didn't do it. We didn't do it then. He said, well, what in the world are you picking on these guys for? And he took his seat. And you felt the room almost tangibly change at that moment. And the chairman of the, of the conference at that minute also felt the change, and he called the question. And out of the 135 or 131 votes that year, 
129 groups, 129 of the people voting said that we should list gay groups or lesbian groups if they wish to be so listed. Only two people voted against it, which is very, very thrilling. <clears throat> And then, then to put the icing on that cake, I love this. Somebody got up immediately after that vote was announced. Somebody got up and said, I want to make a, a, a proposed resolution that it is the sense of the conference that no A group anywhere of any kind should ever turn, a, turn away a newcomer from his first meeting or her first meeting. And that was passed unanimously. Um, that was, a, uh, I think, a great, great moment in our uh, history when we really began to apply the third tradition. We were, some of us, were already, of course, uh, preparing for things like this to happen, uh, looking down the road to peace. Um, I had written, before that, I had written a book, uh, which is an, uh, one of the AA books, which I wrote in 1972, called Living Sober, and... Um, if you read between the lines, if you've never read it, you don't have to, but, uh, um, but if you want to read it sometime, you read between the lines, you'll find several things that spell out meanings to us that aren't uh, uh, obvious to other people. Um, I think they took out one line as a little bit too campy. Um, <laughs> it was something about cruising along, searching, <laughs> searching for love in all the wrong places, you know. Um, I think they took that out because somebody didn't understand it, you know. Um, one of the editors. The writing for AA is fun. You have that many editors. <clears throat> and um, But then in 1976, we, uh, again, the pressure had arisen from around the country that we must have a pamphlet for um, gay people. There were in, then, of course, many more gay groups by 1976. And uh, there also was pa pressure on that we must have a pamphlet put out for Native Americans. We should not, uh, not Indians, but Native Americans. We should have a, a pamphlet put out for Hispanics. We should, put, we should publish a pamphlet for black people. We should publish one for young people. We should publish one for older people. And I'll never forget one delegate on the literature committee that year said, I think we should also publish a pamphlet for illiterates. <laughs> I looked at the chairman, and the chairman looked at me, and we both looked at the secretary. This man meant it. I don't know in what language he thought they would. Well, anyway. Um, so they decided to try to answer all these pressures, uh, to respond to all these pressures, by putting out a pamphlet entitled, So You Think You Are Different. So You Think You Are Different. I didn't like that title. I objected to it and started whining about it, <clears throat> which I had learned in my first year was a very good manipulative trick. Just keep whining long enough and somebody will find a way around your whine or get rid of you. And I kept whining that I thought it sounded snide. So you think you're different, huh? And finally, a straight guy came up with, well, why would you like the title, Do You Think You're Different? Ah, oh, that doesn't sound snide at all. And they said, now we'll have to hire a writer to uh, write this pamphlet, and I said, I have all the stories ready. <laughs> and uh, you read it, maybe. Uh, there it is. Um, we were ready for this one. Do you think you're different? And it does have in it black stories and, and Indian stories, all kinds of stories, old people's stories, young people's stories, and a number of stories in here by people who are gay but never talk about being gay. They talk about other aspects of being different, which I think is marvelous. Um, I believe that the third tradition is a great blessing for us. It has, it has given us not only a double whammy of love when we get together in roundups like this. You know, the other people don't have these, get to have these love feasts like we do. They really don't. I've been to state conventions all over the country and some foreign countries and I've been to all kinds of roundups now across the country. And God, the roundups, the gay roundups are by far the most electric, by far the most loving, by far the most exciting in my opinion. And um, however, I realize as this goes on that there grows for us 
some extra responsibilities because we have got an extra measure of love. We were all helped one way or another by other people of other sexual persuasions at one time or another. And this message has come down through to us from the, those people who started the thing in the 1935, Bill and Dr. Bob and the, the man from, in Akron who said he was a sex deviate and all the messages come down to us pretty, pretty beautifully, pretty sound. I think it's pretty great. Um, but it puts on us some double bur- two, maybe three double burdens. For example, the anonymity tradition comes into play here in a double way. I'm thinking about Dr. Bob's last message, in which he said, I'm sure you've read that, he says, um, let us by all means guard against that erring member, the tongue. I happen to love to gossip. And why do I, when I see somebody turn up at a gay meeting, why am I simply dying to go tell somebody else, guess who came to the gay meeting? I think it's a violation of the A tradition of anonymity. I think that person is entitled to absolute anonymity at what meeting he goes to. I remember the first time at an international convention we had a, um, uh, a, a, a hospitality suite for gay members. It was called the Live and Let Live Hospitality Suite. Wasn't that cute? <clears throat> they had a 24-hour alcathon going on, and they paid for it by charging a dollar a cup for coffee. But there were meetings going on around the clock in this in this hotel room, in the Hilton Hotel in Denver. And there were meetings in Spanish, speakers in Spanish, in German, in uh, uh, French, in uh, uh, I don't know how many languages, uh, South, some, 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 some people in South America, Portuguese, uh, speakers in all languages. And uh, they went all around the clock. Very, very uh, quickly after that, it was decided at the next a- international convention that there, instead of trying to, instead of letting that happen so that the A members went off by themselves and had, the gay members had their own meetings, they would draw a bigger circle and take them in. And so gay members were put on the program with gay program, uh, gay meetings in uh, 1980 in New Orleans. And there are three such scheduled in Montreal in 1985 and they're part of the official program. And I think that's kind of thrilling. Um, but here, in addition to the anonymity tradition and the uh, tradition, there's one other tradition involved here. That is, the question of sexual persuasion is a highly controversial one in this country, isn't it? We don't, we cannot say that this is not an emotional subject. It's a highly controversial one, and it's getting in some places worse. For example, the AIDS scare has made it worse. Um, we have to tread a very delicate line here and make sure we don't insinuate any kind of divisiveness, any kind of controversy into the fellowship that has saved our lives. I think it would be dreadful if we did. Um, <clears throat> I am also impressed by the fact, and a little bit ashamed of the fact, that I haven't yet learned to love enough. I think if the third tradition saying the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking means anything, it means that I owe unconditional love to the next drunk that walks in the door, even if that drunk happens to be a former Miss America or a well-known TV evangelist or a California legislator. I have a lot of learning about love to do. But I think we have to do it. Now, as if we didn't have enough charter, as we already have, um, uh, in for having this kind of meeting, our kind of meeting, there is one other charter that I have found, I discovered myself, uh, accidentally, and I want to share that with you because I think it's the most beautiful of all. Um, I happen to have in my possession, in my keeping at home, the original manuscript of the big book, typed script of the big book, as it went to the printer. I do not consider it my personal possession. As a matter of fact, my will says it belongs to the fellowship. It's already been given to the fellowship, uh, uh, and they own it, but it's in my keeping until I die. 
and then it goes to the archives. You can get, however, if you want them, copies of this Xerox. There are many Xerox copies of it available at the General Service Office in New York. I don't know how much they charge. They probably cost quite a bit. Uh, it's a whole big book as it was originally published in, um, uh, in TypeScript. Um, and by the way, if you've not seen it in TypeScript, the, the, the printer's manuscript is the one to look at. I'll tell you, it's a gas. Um, you, ought, you ought to hear how it works in, uh, the, in the big book as it was originally written. When it gets down to that point about, uh, 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 at this point, we, God could and would if sought. The original manuscript said, and you must find him now. <laughs> if not, if not, go out and drink some more. <laughs> then read the book again. And if you still don't find him, throw the book away. <laughs> they had an awful problem editing that manuscript, as you can see. Well, I found written in the flyleaf of the manuscript, in pencil, some writing, looks like that, handwriting, in pencil, and it's very familiar words. I recognized the words instantly, and I thought, wonder why they are written in pencil in the flyleaf and not printed in the typescript, not typed in typescript. And I got hold of our archivist, Nell, who was Bill's secretary for many years, and we began to run this down. Nell recognized the, the handwriting instantly. The handwriting is that of a man named Hank, <clears throat> who was more of a promoter than Bill was, and that was a lot of promoting. Uh, Hank is probably more responsible than anybody for our having the big book in existence. Hank went out and sold stock in a non-existent company. Uh, <laughs> yes, called it the Works Publishing Company, $25 a share, and uh, he just got bought a blank book of stock certificates and people gave him 20, few, few people gave him $25. At least it kept Lois and Hank and Bill fed uh, during that time. Uh, just before the book was uh, written and published, Lois and Bill moved 57 times within one year because they had no place to live. They couldn't afford to live anywhere. Uh, the book didn't sell enough for there to be any, any money at all. Um, but Hank uh, was pushing the manuscript very hard, pushing the book and getting pushing Bill to get it finished. And um, one night he heard Bill telling his story, again, somewhere, telling what Bill called the bedtime story. Bill had a marvelous way of talking about his experiences. He called his spiritual awakening, you know, that he had in Towns Hospital, where he said he had the great spirit, uh, wind of the spirit blowing through him and all this. He called that his hot flash. Um, <clears throat> and one day he said it may have been the DTs, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. Um, it worked, you know, that was a great thing, and thank God the doctor said it worked. Dr. Silkworth said, whatever you got is better than what you had, hold on to it. Um, well, in, in, telling a, in, in telling his story, Bill told about the fa the, uh, a morning in his, when he was living at, uh, in Brooklyn Heights with uh, his wife, Lois. He was unable to work because he had been, although he had been a Wall Street hotshot, he was now unable to work because of his, drink, his drinking. And Lois was supporting the two of them by working in a department store. And uh, he was at home one morning in Brooklyn Heights, in the house that's still there. I, I have a, a little pamphlet. Brooklyn's put out a little pamphlet for the 80th, uh, 50th anniversary. There's the house. And it was in the kitchen underneath the stoop that Bill was sitting with a bottle of gin in front of him, bathtub gin, in 1934. And um, he got a telephone call from an old drinking chum named Ebby. And he hadn't seen Abby in years, and he loved to drink with Abby. He and Abby had done some marvelous things together, some really ridiculous, wild things. Uh, you know, once upon a time, Abby, for example, and Bill had just drawn, uh, had driven off a highway right into a kitchen. And uh, the lady in the kitchen was a bit disturbed. <clears throat> but Abby said, don't be, uh, don't be alarmed. Do you have, could you spare a cup of coffee? Uh, they had some wild escapades together. <clears throat> so, um, Abby came to see Bill. Abby, Abby called Bill on the phone and said, I want to come to see you. And um, Abby, Bill said, oh, good, we can talk over old times. So, Abby came over, and Abby walked in sober. Bill had never known this man to be sober. Never seen him sober. 
And Bill, of course, pushed across the, you know, he, Bill was as drunk on pity at that moment as he was on, on gin, but he pushed a water glass full of gin across the table to Ebby and said, have a drink. And Ebby said, nope, I've got religion. And Bill's heart sank. He thought Ebby was much too bright for that. <laughs> he said, oh my God, what brand did you get? You know, we thought in terms of brands in uh, many, many of our drinking days. Um, what brand did you get? And Ebby said, well, I don't, I don't know that you call it any brand. I've just run into this bunch of fellows, and we um, have six little ideas, and uh, we simply do these things, and I don't seem to want to drink anymore. And uh, the Brooklyn pamphlet has those six little ideas, which turned into the Twelve Steps, published in here somewhere. Yeah, there they are, just six ideas uh, that turned into the Twelve Steps. <clears throat> And Bill was quite taken by the fact that when he heard these ideas, and he knew that his own case was hopeless because he had already been told by Dr. Silkworth and Lois had been told by Dr. Silkworth that his case was hopeless, that if he ever drank again, he would wind up either uh, in a, uh, with brain damage in the hospital as, as a vegetable for the rest of his life or in a drunkard's grave very soon. So Bill knew there was no hope for him, and he certainly was not about to be religious. So what Bill said, this particular night he was telling the story and Hank was sitting there, when Bill told this part of the story about Ebby, Hank realized it was not in the typescript. It had been left out. Like a lot of us, <laughs> this almost didn't get in. It was not connected anywhere. And thank God, Hank wrote it in pencil, in abbreviations, in the fly, on the flyleaf, and told uh, the printer, put this in on page 12. I'm not a big book scholar. I can't tell you where, how many times the word God or must appear. But at any rate, I do know this is on page 12, because I started, I knew these lines were familiar, but I kept searching through them, and I couldn't find them in the typescript. But now I know what happened, of course. Hank simply gave them to the printer. And this is exactly what they say. It's hard to read because I choke up, and it's also hard to read because uh, Abby was writing, I mean, uh, Hank was writing fast and he used abbreviations. What he wrote was, despite the living example of my friend, there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. When the thought was expressed that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. I could go for such concepts as creative intellect, universal mind, or the spirit of nature, but I resisted the thought of the czar of the heavens, however loving his sway might be. I have since talked with scores of men who felt exactly the same way. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea, and you will find this next idea in italics, as it's underscored in Hank's handwriting. My friend said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? That statement hit me hard, said Bill. It melted the icy intellectual mountains in whose shadows I had lived and shivered for many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. It does seem to me that when Ebby said to Bill, why don't you choose your own conception of God, he laid the foundation down for the third tradition. Surely, if we are not to impose our own conceptions of God or anybody else, and we don't want anyone imposing theirs on us, surely none of us has, his, has any business imposing our sexual codes on other people. 
and we don't want to, them to impose theirs on us. Uh, I sometimes think that there is a miracle in my life, because when I was sober, I mean, when I was drunk, I used to often say, why me? Why was I the one picked out for all this suffering? And even after I got sober, that went on for a long time, why me? Why do so many people drink and get by with it? And why me? And I had that feeling again a few years ago when my lover died after 26 years. I had the feeling, why me? Why does it happen to me? Um, I've since come to discover, since come to learn, since come to believe, why not me? Why not me? And some days, some evenings, I think I get out of the corner of my eye just a slight glimpse of a running away shadow, and that's the reason why it's me. I think all my life I've been on my way to be here at home with you tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.